Let's just pray. Father, we give you thanks for this opportunity to give. And Lord, again, we just pray, Lord, that you would just bless those that are given. Just give them back many times, Lord, what they have given to you. And so, Lord, I pray that this morning as we take and use these tithes and offerings in this church for this, your kingdom, give us wisdom. We pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. A few things on church news. As I get my sermon. So we've got our women's retreat coming up in just three weeks' time. And uh, Trish needs payment to come in for that. And if you give online, uh, there's details in the bulletin. Yep. And she just, so if you're going to give online, just have a chat with Trish because you just need to note it in the, in the uh, reference part of it just to say that it's for the, the, uh, the women's retreat. But... Um, it's going to be an excellent, excellent time. Uh, we have extra coming up on the 9th of December, uh, so put that one in your diaries as well. That's going to be another excellent night, and, um, and I'm sure God's going to do some great things that night as well. Uh, I think that's it for church news. So we're going to, just before we come to the Word of God, spend time, some time in prayer. And um, for those who don't know, uh, Victor's brother Daniel has gone missing and uh, they don't know where he is. He's been gone for three days, I think, and um, the police have put out a, a, a um, appeal for help on uh, Facebook. And uh, so we're just going to pray that one, that he's safe, uh, and two, that he's restored to the family, and uh, three, that he can be healed as well. He's been through a really rough time and um, we're just going to pray that Jesus meets him wherever he is at. So if you want to just pray with me, appreciate that. So, Father, we say thank you for this time this morning. Lord, we don't know uh, where Daniel is, but you do. And so, Jesus, would you meet him wherever he is at and just pour your grace upon him. And, Jesus, we pray that he'll be restored into the family even this very day. And so, Lord, we just want to pray that you'll continue to put um, just people around him to draw him to places of healing. Just pray for the family through this time, and it's just tremendously worrying. I can't even imagine what they're, they're going through. But Lord, I want to pray for Victor and Naomi and their whole family, Lord, that this day that you'll bring a peace over them. Hmm. Father, we think of uh, this message that we're about to hear, and again, Lord, we just want to hear you speak. And so, Lord, I just want to put a, a, even aside my own voice, thoughts, and, and just want to pray, Father, for your word to be declared right in this very room. Uh, so, Lord, I pray that you give us ears to hear what the Spirit's saying and that this week, Lord, that we'll be able to use what the Spirit has spoken in our, in our lives. And so, Lord, I want to pray that this morning right now will be a healing morning, a uh, morning of restoration, transformation right in this very room. In Jesus' name. Amen. Michael, can I get that out of the fold? Um, that would be awesome. If you've got your Bibles... I will be reading from Revelation chapter 1. So I'm going to do a couple of messages in Revelation in November. Revelation is one of those uh, books of the Bible that very few people, um, very few ministers actually preach from because some of it is out there and beyond. If you uh, listen to commentaries and, and read different translations, you'll, you'll hear some people that uh, believe that they understand fully the, the full revelation of Revelation. Um, good luck to that. Uh, I haven't found that yet. And uh, I think there's things in Revelation that the Lord has yet to reveal to us. And once we get to heaven, it's just going to be, okay, I get that now. I get that. But uh, there's, there's key parts of Revelation that I just think are so powerful and so cool that I just thought, you know what, I just want to spend a little bit of time just speaking about the kingdom of God and what it looks like in the book of Revelation. It might interest you to know that over, over the centuries and over the millennia, um, books in the Bible have come and gone. Revelation has never. It's always been there. Right from the early onset moments of, of the fledgling church, the, Re the book of Revelation, its, its authenticity has never been challenged and it's always been in Scripture, uh, which 
times when you think of the many centuries that we've gone through, um, I could imagine that some people might want to have dropped Revelation altogether. But I'm so glad that they haven't. So I just want to spend a couple of weeks uh, speaking to you what the kingdom actually looks like through the eyes of the book of Revelation. So if you've got your Bibles, Revelation chapter 1, I'm looking at verse 4 to verse 6. And it says this, This letter is from John to the seven churches in the province of Asia. Grace and peace to you from the one who is, who always was, and who is still to come. From the sevenfold spirit before his throne and from Jesus Christ. He is the faithful witness to these things, the first to rise from the dead and the ruler of all the kings of the world. All glory to him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by shedding his blood for us. He has made us a kingdom of priests for God his, for God his Father. All glory and power to him forever and ever. Amen. John says that word amen many times through the book of Revelation and often I just wonder whether he just says it because he's just received something so magnificent and so wonderful all he can do is say amen. Uh, You know in churches these days where people do that and occasionally you guys do and I encourage you guys to do it. It's just like when the Lord actually lands something on your plate that you just go, yep, that's a revelation. You just go, amen, amen. Last night we, uh, with Spirit and Grace here, it was just again a, a great outpouring of God's spirit so many things occur in a night like that uh, and as the night finishes and person after person wants to come forward and explain their revelation to you uh, it's one of the best parts of the whole night for me I enjoy leading it it's a lot of fun um, it's you've got some really really great people to be working with uh, in all areas so we had three artists or actually four artists the fourth one um, gave her art away before I got a chance to see it. She did like a postcard. But up here on the, the, the side here, this is a charcoal drawing. And like I said to you at the start of the service, at the end of the service I want you to come up and have a look at this thing because there's so much detail at the closer you get to it. And you'll see as you look at it, it's a, a portrait of this church. And you'll, you'll get that with the windows and the, the beams at the top. You can't really see it from a distance. And from a distance, all I could see was the cross. But the closer you get, the closer you see the people. And I thought that's just a great example of what kingdom actually looks like. Because if you stand from a distance and look at a church, you can look at a church and you go, well, that's what the ch- that church looks like. But you will only understand the kingdom if you get close to the people that are within the church. And so if you go over and closer, you'll see that there are people lifting other people up. There are people that are encouraging. There are people that are rejoicing. There's angels up the top. You may not even be able to see that until you get close to it. But there's angels to the left and the right that are just rejoicing in the house of God. And this is kind of what the kingdom looks like. The kingdom. This past week I've done four prophetic groups and each one of them have been slightly different. And again, to each one, they come away from that going, why can't this be church? Three of those group, or two of those groups are for outside of our church. Two of those groups are within the church. And again, this same phrase, and I remember at the start of the year at our men's retreat, it was Andrew Dickinson that said this phrase, why can't this be church? And when you start hearing that phrase again and again and again in the environment of a community, you start going, well, this is what church is starting to look like. We are desiring to hear the voice of the Lord. Is that not right? This morning, I got a text message from one of, the, one of our ladies. She's not here today. Her name is Yagi. And I wanted to read this to you because this is like a, a testimony of the group. Uh, she was wanting to be here this morning to, to speak it out, but she went to a Macedonian wedding last night and it went late. So let me just read this for you. She says this, thank you, thank you, with a smiley face. Don't we love emojis? Thank you, thank you for running these groups. Although my nerves can get the best of me speaking in front of a crowd, I enjoy speaking in groups this size. There is something so special about it, a sense of closeness. I still wanted my words to be communicated on what being a part of this mentoring group actually means to me. I still wanted and needed to voice all that it is bringing. 
It is steering, it is restoring, it is a breath of fresh air, it is revealing more and more, knowing who we are in Christ, knowing the plans that he has for us to prosper us and not to harm us. I am loving it so far and continue to look forward to it. And also to to bring my niece, Christina, she values this and needs this more and more. And she too is loving being a part of these Saturday mornings. Being a part of it with such a beautiful group of people makes it all a double blessing. That's kind of what the church and the kingdom look like. Tonight I'm going to speak at another church over at Bankstown and they've asked me to speak on the topic of peacemaking. What I'm going to be doing is bringing them what a peacemaker actually looks like and you're about to hear my version of that. Inside of this scripture, the Apostle John is speaking out about Christ. And we are being made in the very image of Christ. We have been transformed more and more into the glory of Christ. We, we get all that. We hear all that all the time. Uh, and, and here is Jesus. And it says firstly, and the first point is this, he is a faithful witness to all the things that are happening. A faithful witness. And I wonder whether this morning you could receive that phrase, that you are a faithful witness. Now, the word witness in Scripture, you're ready for the Greek of the word witness? And you may not pick this one, but the word witness in Scripture means to be a martyr. I have not one amen in the room, right? And John identifies himself with Christ in this way. I am a faithful witness. He is a faithful witness. And what that means is I will be a faithful witness even to the point of dying. That is how seriously and how passionately I take my relationship with the Father in heaven. I will be a faithful witness. I think being a faithful witness of the kingdom shows something of what's actually going on inside of you. Because if you are a faithless witness, you actually aren't going to bring or affect anyone for the kingdom of God. If you are a faithful witness, there's stuff going on inside of you that you just cannot contain. And that's been the joy of watching people in these prophetic groups. That's been the joy of watching people when they gather for things like spirit and grace or extra. That's what the joy is when you you meet somebody over a cup of coffee and you start speaking of what the kingdom is actually doing and you are a faithful witness to it. John was a faithful witness even when people thought he was going nuts. So John sees Jesus transfigured with Peter and James and the Bible says that they can't even utter that until Jesus ascends and goes to heaven because they thought people would think they're crazy. But at some point they've gone, I don't care anymore. I am just going to be a faithful witness for what I have seen Jesus do and if anyone wants to call me crazy, well that's just okay. Who's up for that this morning? David himself would say, I'm re- prepared to be even more ridiculous than this. And he, like, you know, he danced out of his clothes when he was worshipping in front of the ark, right? And, and you get this concept in Scripture that it's all or nothing with the kingdom. And, and that to be a faithful witness is to see the things of the kingdom and to speak the things of the kingdom. I know I've shared this with you guys before, but when I was a teenager, I, I embellished my testimony because I wanted it to sound better. And I discovered this not so long after that, that if you actually embellish truth, freedom doesn't happen. Because freedom happens from truth. And so if you want to speak truth, freedom will be a byproduct of it. If you want to embellish the truth, freedom does not occur. So to be a faithful witness. And I know at times when you're a pastor, you can actually uh, pump people's tires up and make them feel better about stuff and to get them to come to stuff or whatever it is. But when you are a faithful witness, the Spirit of God is just testifying to what is actually happening and actually I don't need to pump anyone's tires up to be a faithful witness. And so when I get a text message from Yagi like that, that she wants you guys to hear, all I'm doing is reading word to word. What I'm seeing with Yagi in her, in her group, and anyone else is in that group will be able to testify to this, 
Yagi, she is as quiet as a church mouse, but she can hear God speak uh, through the Bible like nobody's business. She and Debbie are amazing, absolutely amazing. They'll read the verses there on a screen and just go, yep, that is exactly what God is saying, and they won't even have to read it through twice. She's hearing God speak, and she's just speaking it out. And it's just when you hear people do that, you don't expect that from you stop and listen to what they have to say. Because what's going on in here can't remain. It starts flowing out of her. She is being a faithful witness for all that God is doing. So what it looks like to be in the kingdom, what it looks like to be a peacemaker, it starts off point number one, is that you are a faithful witness. In Matthew chapter 5, Jesus says, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be known as children of God. It's the only beatitude where that identity is given. And so blessed are the ones who follow after peace. Peace is a fruit of the Holy Spirit. So blessed are those who are so much ingrained with the Spirit of God that peace is just flowing out of them. They are then known as children of God. It's their identity. They are faithful witnesses. The next thing that that John brings us to is Jesus. And it says that Jesus who loves us and freed us from our sins by shedding his blood for us Now, if you want to understand what it looks like to be in the kingdom, you've got to get your brain around this phrase here. Because through the blood of Christ, I have been set free. Now, we've said that forever. What I have discovered is that the more I learn and understand of grace, the more understandable I become. I can tell anyone out there that Jesus... Uh, died for my sins. Chances are most people aren't going to understand what that means. I can tell people that Jesus gave up his life for me and they go, oh, that, that's cool. That's fine. But they may not understand what that means. And so if you can actually articulate what grace actually looks like, if you can understand what grace actually looks like in your, di- in, in your in the diagram of your life or the matrix of your life, before you know it, it starts leaking from you. And so here is John. He says, Jesus loves you. And he, and he died for you. And he gave up his life. He paid the price by shedding his blood on that cross for you. And we go, amen and praise God. What that means to me is this. Through his death, He has opened a door for me to have a relationship with the Father in heaven. That doesn't mean it's from a distance. It means it's real and it's present and it's here and it's today. That that his relationship with me looks like something of the Garden of Eden where I can be walking down the street and he can be conversing with me. Can we have that this morning? You might sit there and go, well, that hasn't happened to me. My prophetic statement to you is, yet. Can you receive that this morning? Because this is a part of understanding what the kingdom of God looks like. You've got to understand what the cross is all about. You've got to understand what Christ actually opened up for us. It wasn't just to forgive you. It was to restore you. It was to open up a pathway where transformation is not not just a word, it's a reality. It's something that you'll watch. It's something that you'll see. It's something that is tangible. It's something that you can talk about. It's something that you can explain. And it's way more than just 2,000 years ago, Christ died on a cross. And it's as profound as that is for me. Now I get it from a tangible way where I can explain it to somebody sitting across from me over a cup of coffee. That's point number two. Point number three, Jesus says, you are now a kingdom of priests. How do you feel about being known as a priest? Catholic priest. It's awkward for half all the women here. Um, Anglican priest, they have priests too, right? Before any denomination has called anyone priest, Jesus himself declared that you're a priest. And so the question is, well, what does that mean? It's cool that I'm a priest. Do you like being a priest, Donna? She doesn't know. <laughs> the word priest in the Greek means this, one who administers the sacrificial rites. So how many people here enjoy administering the sacrificial rites?
you're not even sure what the sacrificial rites are? Is that what you're telling me? <laughs> well, let me explain to you what the sacrificial rites are. When Christ was sacrificed, the right that was given to us was forgiveness. It was restoration and redemption. As a priest, you have that authority. In John chapter 20, Jesus turns up behind a locked door. It's after his resurrection. And the, you remember the story, the disciples all locked away. And Jesus turns up in that room. Nobody really sure how that happens. But man, if you can come back from the dead, you can physically do anything at all. And so Jesus turns up in a room, freaks the life out of them. And he, and he says to them this, peace be with you. They probably needed to hear that. Then he said, my spirit I give to you. And then he said, whatever you forgive on this planet is forgiven in the heavens. That's an incredible form of authority that the Lord has bestowed in you. Whatever you forgive is forgiven. Does that just blow your brain as far as being a Christian is? And, and so if, if, if Rochelle does something to offend me and I forgive that, it's forgiven in the heavens. She is released. She, she is released. Do you know what the word forgiveness in the Greek means? This might actually uh, stretch your brain too. To forgive is to send something away. That's what the Greek word, to send it away. To not forgive or to be unforgiven is to hold fast. So what that means, if, if Rochelle offends me, right, and, and I choose to not forgive her, I'm holding fast on the offence and I'm not letting it go and therefore it's staying in the heavens. Do you understand the authority that you have? And so for, if Rochelle does this to me, and she hasn't done this, I'm just using this as a hypothetical thing, but if, if, she, if she had and I chose to hold on to that, there's something so supernatural about that that's in the heavens. But as soon as I say to Rochelle, I forgive you, and there's this supernatural event and moment that happens both vertically, the kingdom, and then horizontally between Rochelle and I. This is me operating as a priest, administrating the sacrificial Rights. At the end of Matthew, where Jesus gives all authority to his disciples, you always wonder, what did that mean? Like, what's the limits of that? And I'm just giving you some part of it right now. In administering the sacrificial rites as a priest, as you hold within you the power to release and forgive sin, to send it away. Send it away. So it's like if Rochelle does that, I've just sent away the sin. I haven't sent her away. I've kept her because I want the relationship, but I've sent away the offense. And that's a supernatural act as a priest being designated by God. What does it look like to be in the kingdom? What does the kingdom actually look like? Well, there's three little points that I've, I've just put together here. As children of God, like the, the, you, can, you can see that as a priest that we have a function. Through the blood of Christ, we have a relationship. And through Christ's witness, we have a task. To be his witness. To be his witness. One of the things we did last night, uh, at one point in the, the Spirit and Grace moment, you know how in this at our, our church, how I've been getting everyone to think of a vision or a dream or a verse or a whatnot? I used that last night as well. And I just said to all the people here, some are familiar with that sort of stuff, some people aren't, and I just said, I just want you just to think of a, a picture or a verse. and. I just want you then to go and, and give it to someone else that you're not married to. Uh, you always got to do that because when married couples sit together, they think they're safe and I can just share that with the person next to me. And so you just got to just move that a little bit further away. But what actually happened from standing up in front and why I love doing this is, is that joy just occurs inside the room. You can hear it in people's voices. There's wonder in the room. Uh, there's revelation in the room. 
Like last night I was standing up the front doing all this sort of stuff, just sitting here with my guitar on, and one of, one of the guys walks up the front and he says, man, I've got a word for you. And I said, just, okay, I'd love to have that word. And he says, what I see is a coffee cup. And I said, bring that. And he spoke about this word for me to say that, not that I have to drink more coffee, that's not what the word was, but over cups of coffee, people's lives have been restored. Now why that means a lot to me is over the last three weeks I've used that analogy at least a dozen times. And here is a guy who doesn't know that, walks up and speaks it to me there. Do you know what happens? Joy just happens right there. This is what the kingdom looks like. Now it would have still been a good night if he didn't come up and do that. Sometimes it's a bit... um, like it takes a lot for a person to walk up and stop the person who's doing the worship leading to say, I've got a word for you, but I love it when people do that. And, um, but to stand there and just go, you can't possibly know what I've been sharing. And I'm just being told it back. This is what the kingdom looks like. It doesn't look like a building. It doesn't look like a denomination. It looks like relationship, both loving one another and loving him. In the book of Revelation, it's Jesus breaking into the world to show the final redemption of, of, of humankind. But he speaks it from the very present moment that John is in and all the way through the rest. So the last 2,000 years, the book of Revelation has been working its way out. And it starts here, like this is what the kingdom actually looks like, to be a faithful witness, to understand the grace of our Father in heaven, so much so that we can actually speak it so freely and so openly and so honestly. And And then finally, that we understand the priesthood that we've actually been called into. Do you know where that came from? In the book of Exodus, when the, the Israelites first got to Mount Sinai, the, the, God said to them, you are my kingdom of priests. And what they took from that over time was that they were the kingdom of priests to each other, not to the whole world. When Jesus came along, he broke that open and he said, it's not just to, to Israel. It's now to the whole world. And so here in Australia, where we live in such a multicultural moment in time, we have the whole world gathered around us. And here is Jesus just going, it's working exactly the way I need it to work. So don't be afraid for the church. Be encouraged for what God is doing. This is what the kingdom looks like. We're going to pray together. And Father, I thank you for children of God that we are. Because that, se- that tells me and that says to me that we are family. And so Lord, I just say thank you for your grace that's inside of this very room. And so Lord, I pray that this morning even the words that have been spoken or the songs that have been sung or the prayers that have been prayed, Lord, will do something inside of our spirit that just ca- causes us to be the kingdom wherever we are. To be the kingdom when life is going well. To be the kingdom when it feels like the wheels are falling off. To be the kingdom where a brother goes missing or a family implodes or a family separates or, or somebody is very ill. Or, but Lord, in those places that we can be the kingdom of God, that we can take the grace that we carry, the authority that we carry, the, the fact that we are priests in the kingdom to, to administer these sacrificial rites. And I know that sounds all kind of fancy, but it just means that we have the power to release people from their sins. And that only comes through Jesus. It is not through our own self-righteousness. It's not through any effort or deed on our own. It's only through what Christ has done inside of our lives. And so this morning, Lord, I just want to say thank you for each person who is here and the kingdom, Lord, that they represent. Father, may this week be an opportunity for us to represent that regularly. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's sing together. And so, Father, we say thank you once again that you are the one who called us and knows us by name. You call us family. You've even lifted us up to call us.
priests of the kingdom. And so, Lord, I pray that that phrase will not be an offensive phrase. Rather, it will be something of a kingdom phrase as we step into places of authority and, and power of the kingdom. And so, Lord, give us eyes to see and ears to hear all that the Spirit is doing. Father, I pray now as we go downstairs and have coffee and tea and morning tea, Lord, that you'll bless that time, bless the conversations that we have. But Lord, in the week ahead, let the glory of the Lord flow out from each one of us. In Jesus' name, amen. Come on downstairs, have a cup of coffee.